is uh, where I said to the speakers before we begin this, uh, if you are not speaking at that moment, please keep yourself on mute and unmute yourself when you are called on just so we can make sure everyone has crisp, clear audio. We are full transparency. We're recording this um, so that people, uh, media who might not be able to attend today can have access to the event. Um, we not going to do anything nefarious with it, but just want to be upfront and transparent with everyone there. Um, and we'll give it one more minute here and then I'll kick it off. All right, everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, I think, Commissioner, I think you wanted to start off with just a few words speaking to the events of last week before we kicked off the wildfire event. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining me today, elected officials, media, special guests, and others. Um, before we get started, I want to just take a minute to thank our elected leaders the dedicated women and men who ran for office to serve their communities, to serve our state, to serve our nation. The unrest and violence that has taken place at our nation's capital and here in our state capital is extremely unsettling. In America, we settle our differences at the ballot box and the voters did that in November. Thank you to the leaders who stood tall in the face of threats and danger. Thank you to all the Democrats and Republicans who denounced the violence that was meant to upend the will of the voters. And thank you to the media joining us today. You do the job we expect of you every day to report the news unfiltered and unvarnished. You ask the tough questions as you should and we respect you for it. I am deeply troubled to see the anger directed towards you, the threats and abuse for simply doing your job. There is no place for that behavior in civil society. You're, as I see it, the fourth branch of government and you are vital to the transparency of our state, local and our national governments. I believe, as do so many of us across our state and nation, that we are all in this together, just like we are when we fight wildfires. And that's how we'll get through this unrest together. We'll emerge as we always do, stronger, united and more determined than ever to safeguard this democracy. So I wanna thank you to everyone for being here today. And thank you to our leaders who are working hard throughout our country and in this state. With that, we'll kick off today's press conference with a short video. All right, thank you, Commissioner. We will uh, play that video just as soon as you all get the recording permissions. Stand by.
the best way to describe it is literally look like a bomb had gone off. Fire station was gone. The city hall is gone. The post office completely gone. This is very devastating to our town. We had no chance. We had little time. Too often, it takes a tragedy like this to get people to wake up, get our leaders to wake up, to actually invest. People are like, this is a tragedy that nobody saw coming. Well, that is not true. This is something everybody knew was likely to happen. We completely are fighting with everything we got, but we don't have enough. We have got to stop ignoring and turning our back on communities like this. We have the tools in place to truly address this, reduce these catastrophic fires, make our landscapes more resilient, make our communities more resilient. And where everybody needs to be focusing their attention and time right now is doing exactly that. I was coming back and I saw these people kind of rushing towards that area and they all looked concerned. I turned around and I instantly saw this humongous cloud of smoke. I mean, it was dark and scary and, and it looked like it was just down on that block. And I went, oh crap, and I ran in here and I said, Paul, it started again. And I got the alert that it was uh, be prepared to leave. And then right after that, it was leave now. And that's when it got really scary. I stood in the middle of the living room and said, what do you take? That was really horrible to think that everything yeah. could be gone. People need to understand that this is, is the new reality. It used to be an east side thing, but obviously it's not anymore. And, and how much it can impact a, a community. And we are so lucky again that uh, if the fire would have shifted a little bit, the devastation could have been a lot worse. When we did come back and see the damage so close, it was obvious it was coming our way. It was only like a mile or so away. Like, I don't have experience with fire. We live in the wet side. <laughs> you know, never thought this would happen to East no. Western Washington ever. No. I wake up in the morning just pray. Pray that we will not lose one firefighter's life, one citizen's life, one home, one community. It is a horrible feeling when you are basing so much on prayer. And I need every single resident of Washington State to care. Not just today, tomorrow, and every day until we have the resources to help protect these communities and protect our firefighters. All right, thank you so much, Tatum, for running that video. Uh, we should be, as I understand it, getting you all Zooming permissions as I speak. So in, with that being resolved, Commissioner Franz, do you want to start off our speaking program? Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for joining us this morning. The stories in that short video are critically important because right now we look outside, clouds in the sky, rain falling. It makes it easy to forget just how devastating wildfire season can be in Washington. We have been here before. After every wildfire season, we have heard the calls for action on wildfire funding give way to the cycle of tragedy, inaction, and forgetting. And we're here today to break that cycle. The legislation we're proposing today will for the first time create a dedicated account for wildfire response, forest restoration, and community resilience. And we're asking the legislature to fund this account with $125 million each biennium, allowing our state to finally have the resources we need to prevent and respond to wildfires, to accelerate the pace and scale of forest restoration and make our communities more resilient. Put simply, to give our force, our communities, and our firefighters a fighting chance against these catastrophic fires. This bill is our blueprint for creating the self-reliance we need to prevent the evergreen state from turning charcoal black. For years, we've relied on luck and hope instead of fully funding a comprehensive wildfire strategy. But hope will not prevent wildfires and luck does not put them out. 
Our firefighters heroically fight every year, months on end to keep us safe. But every year they are stretched too thin to keep up when multiple out of control fires strike at the same time. In air resources, equipment and firefighters, we are too reliant on federal assistance that year after year is often not available. When this happens, our communities pay the price. Our firefighters pay the price. The 2020 wildfire season was tragic and destructive. We responded more than 1,600 fires statewide, more than 800,000 acres burned, and nearly 300 homes were destroyed. The hardest moment on the job for me have been the trips to visit the people behind these statistics. Moments like the heartbreaking scene in Malden where almost every building, home, city hall, even the fire station was destroyed. Hearing the mayor tell me through tears that the flames came so fast through the town that many residents were only able to escape with the clothes on their back before the fires burned their homes. 80% of the homes were leveled. Or the devastating moment when I learned that a child had been lost in the Cold Springs fire. His parents sustained terrible burns as they tried desperately to keep him safe and outrun a fire. He was one years old. We should care enough about the tragedies that towns across Washington have suffered to take action. About what happened in Malden, OMAC, Yakima, and Bonnie Lake. The fact is that out of control wildfire is now a threat to every Washingtonian on both sides of the Cascades. Over 2 million homes in total are at risk in Washington and it's growing. We saw what this threat looks like for Amboy, just a short drive from my hometown of Portland. We see in Seattle and throughout the state worst air quality in the world for the last two out of three years. And hundreds of residents in Bonnie Lake, striking distance from Tacoma, fled their homes to escape the summer grade fire. While they prayed for their homes to be spared, more than one family shared the same thought. I never thought this could happen in Western Washington. Wildfires are inevitable, but wildfire catastrophes are not inevitable. We've seen proof in recent years that aggressively attacking fires on the landscape early with both aircraft and ground crews keep them small and mitigate damage. This strong initial attack is expensive and requires a lot of resources, but you can't put a price on the safety of the public and the protection of our homes and our lands. Sadly, we saw what can happen when we don't have those resources, the perfect horrific storm of Labor Day weekend was exacerbated by skeleton crews and aircraft trying to fight against horrific winds. The demand for resources across Western Washington, across Eastern Washington, across the state and West Coast, continually we lose out because most of those resources at the national level are already being deployed in other states. Right now, more than ever, we can solve this, but we need the leadership of everyone in our legislature to step up and help fund the resources that will give our state, our communities, and our firefighters a fighting chance. I want to thank Representative Springer for sponsoring our bill. Thank you for your leadership. I know you understand that proactive investments are needed now to address our forest health and make our communities more prepared and more resilient so we don't face another Malden or Bonnie Lake again. 125 million in dedicated funding will help us change the trajectory of devastation and cost. Investments in the first two years would include 75.2 million for wildfire response, hiring 100 new firefighters, expanding our air fleet so that we can do an aggressive initial attack even when multiple fires break out and fight fires in the dark of night. Purchasing equipment that will keep our firefighters safe and modern technology to detect fires early before the burn out of control. 31.4 million for forest health and an additional 5.9 million for workforce development. This will fully fund our 20 year forest health plan, allowing us to restore the health and natural wildfire resistance of 1.25 million acres of forests. And this work creates career paths from forester to firefighter to mill worker, bringing good paying jobs to the communities that need them most. This bill will also invest 12.6 million in community resilience, allowing us to protect and defend our communities on the front lines. We know which communities are at risk. Believe it or not, 
three communities in Washington have a higher wildfire risk than Paradise, California. And we all remember those tragic images. This bill will help us take action to protect at risk areas by building fuel breaks and providing direct assistance to homeowners to create defensible space on their property. This bill will also bolster local governments and fire departments. Our local fire districts are first on the line in these fires and many have limited resources and capacity. We cannot do this alone. We need our local fire districts to have the critical resources for us all to fight this together. Passing this bill, this legislation, this legislative session is a make or break for Washington. We have to remember what happened in Malden, Omac, Yakima, Amboy, and Bonnie Lake. We must take steps to say never again. Washington is a large state, but no matter how far apart we live from each other, we will share our successes and our failures in wildfire response. It's time to lead on this issue, to take the proactive steps to protect our communities and make them wildfire ready, to stand up for our firefighters who are putting their lives on the line every single day for us. It's time for us to take care of Washington and prevent the evergreen state from going charcoal black. All right, thank you so much, Commissioner. Really appreciate it. Uh, I will now move to Representative Springer, who is the prime sponsor of the bill in the State House. Uh, thank you, thank you, Commissioner, for your commitment uh, to this effort. Um, uh, we've got a lot of work to do in this upcoming legislative session. Uh, this is the priority bill for me. Um, the Commissioner has laid out uh, the landscape the, uh, the condition that we are really facing, um, and that video showed it very clearly um, with what happened in Malden. But remember Pateras, uh, half of that town nearly burned down uh, a few years ago in the Carlton Complex fire. Um, admittedly, this is a little personal for me. I, my wife and I own vacation uh, cabin over near Lake Wenatchee and two years ago, we were evacuated. Um, and come to find out the fire that was burning, that caused that evacuation was burning in an area that had not seen a flicker of fire for over a hundred years. The fuel load that had built up over that time was enormous. Uh, when we talk about forest management and forest health, that's what we're talking about, going back into those areas that we can clearly identify and reducing that fuel load. Uh, and and starting to build protective barriers around uh, what we call the, you know, the urban wildfire interface, that little, that area of land between where people live and, and where the forests are. Um, so the, from a legislative point of view and from a budget point of view, I wanna emphasize that uh, $125 million uh, every biennium is a lot of money. On the other hand, uh, paying for the cost of putting out wildfires all over the state will cost us ever so much more. This is the old homily, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention. Uh, it just makes good fiscal sense, if not good moral and economic sense. Um, our forests are burning. Um, our homes are burning. Our towns are burning. Uh, people are losing livelihoods. And if we think this is going to end by itself someday, well, that's fantasy. So uh, I commend the commissioner for her commitment here. Um, the bill was dropped today. It was introduced today, uh, 1168. Uh, I'm the prime sponsor and representative Joel Kretz from Okanagan uh, is second on the bill. Um, and we look forward to talking with our colleagues and seeing if we uh, can't make this reality. So with that, uh, thanks for having me on. Thank you very much, Representative. Next, we'll move to East Pierce Fire and Rescue Chief Bud Backer. Hello, thank you uh, for having me here here today. Uh, this is a pretty important topic to me. I started my uh, career in the fire service as a volunteer over in the Tri Cities and was inducted into wildfire uh, suppression quite quickly, uh, working in that area. But my last 32 years uh, have been as a firefighter here in Western Washington. Uh, when I first moved here, I thought, boy, they sure get excited about a one acre fire. 
and, uh, but soon learned the sagebrush was quite a bit taller uh, on this side of the state. Um, but uh, getting aside, uh, during that 32 years, I've, I've seen uh, a very concerning change in wildland fire behavior, one that kind of leads to some of the comments you heard earlier from the citizens about, I never thought I would see that in Western Washington. What used to be a slow moving fire that would consume one to five acres, they're now exploding into fast moving fires that consume much larger areas and easily spread to homes and other buildings. More and more, these fires threaten the lives of our neighbors. And yet we continue to build homes and communities further into what was previously forced and the problem grows even more. Granted, weather conditions such as warm temperatures, dry fuels and low humidity need to support the rapid growth of fire, but these conditions seem to be occurring more and more in Western Washington. The fact that we now see rapid fire growth at two o'clock in the morning, that's something we never used to encounter here. That was something we would only see in Eastern Washington, or if by chance we went south to California. While nothing is guaranteed, we must have additional resources to combat these fires when they erupt. Additional wildland firefighters, engines and aerial resources such as helicopters and fixed wing tankers are what are needed so we could hit these uh, fires harder and faster to keep them smaller. The Sumner grade fire on September 8th drove this point home, the fire that we experienced here in, in, in East Pierce Fire and Rescue. By the end of the first day, this fire was nearly 500 acres. Within a few hours of the fire first being reported at midnight, we requested resources from state fire mobilization only to be told that uh, there were no resources available due to the high fire activity statewide. Later that day, we did uh, uh, receive three helicopters uh, through the DNR that, uh, but we had to share those helicopters with three other or two other fires occurring within our region. Those helicopters were instrumental in, uh, in helping us prevent the loss of more homes. We did lose two but those helicopters helped us save many, many more. Uh, but if they were, were available to us the entire time, we may have been able to limit the damage e even more and potentially keep the fire from jumping uh, State Route 410. The importance of, of being able to suppress these fires while they are smaller cannot be understated. There will be times where there will not be enough to go around or when wind conditions will dictate the outcome but we can do more to increase the potential to save lives and property, both in fire prevention and our capability to suppress these fires when they start. Why have, excuse me, why have wildfires become more dangerous in Western Washington? It's most likely the result of many factors. Argue politics all you want, but it is happening. Whether it's climate change, forest management, or more people moving into the forested areas, they all contribute to the threat. There's no quick fix that will change the, the scenario that we have before us, but we must prepare today for tomorrow's wildfire so we can prevent property damage and save lives. So in closing, I'd like to thank Commissioner Franz for her leadership on this issue. Uh, it's very important that we look at this as a statewide issue and not just for an east side issue. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Next, we have Carrie Nissen with the American Lung Association. Carrie, you're on mute. That's my favorite trick to do during Zoom meetings these days. Um, Carrie Nissen with the American Lung Association. It's, it's, uh, it, it's a real honor to be with you here today. This is a really important issue. Uh, at the American Lung Association, we often say, if you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And this tagline really comes to life when we can literally see the air where we work and play. And maybe we can't see the neighbor's home across the street because of an unwelcome visitor in our neighborhoods, wildfire smoke. Wildfire smoke doesn't recognize city boundaries, county boundaries, or state boundaries. Where wildfire smoke has invaded one area of our state, it is likely to move on to another area, another city, another town. The pervasive smoke created by wildfires in Washington is a state problem and a state challenge, and it's worthy of a statewide response. The health impacts of smoke are well doc documented in the literature. Increases in the frequency and intensity of wildfires worsens our air quality, harms our lungs, 
and harms our public health. This small contains very small particles, much smaller than the diameter of a human hair. These particles slip through our defense system and can lodge deeply in our lungs. Some of these particles can cross barriers and go directly to our bloodstreams, causing inflammation and illness. And there's more bad news. This smoke carries other toxins, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, and volatile organic compounds, all of these which can combine to increase ground ozone levels, another significant air pollutant and health harm. Smoke with these particles can cause early mortality, early morbidity, the exposure can lead to cancers, respiratory problems, including asthma and bronchitis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and reduced lung function. Our children suffer and are especially vulnerable to smoke. Exposure can prevent or delay lung development. The elderly are vulnerable, as are the with chronic diseases and those working outdoors. The time is here to implement solutions to lessen our exposure to wildfire smoke, protect our lungs, and protect our public health. Thank you very much, Carrie. Next, we will have uh, Chairman Rodney Costin, Cobalt Cobal Tribes. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. My name is Rodney Costin, and I'm the chairman for the Cobalt Confederated Tribes. You know, um, interesting, you know, that uh, Commissioner Fran says, let's. Uh, uh, makes a comment about Washington being black. If you walk, if you you know took a drive around here around the Cobble Reservation, especially at the end of the, our summer, you'd see a lot of blackened uh, landscapes all across our reservation. And so uh, um, you know that just kind of struck me. You know, with your last comment, during the month of September, the Cobble Reservation experienced one of the largest catastrophic fires in our history. In total, we lost we had about five wildland fires occurring simultaneously on the Cobble Reservation. The Cold Springs fire burning on the western part of the Cobble Reservation stretching from OMAC to Bridgeport was reported to be 188,852 acres with 134 miles of perimeter. And then the Inchlium Complex fire, which burned um, approximately 19,400 acres. The destruction included hundreds of power lines, of power poles, um, hundreds of miles of fencing, lost agriculture, the loss of hundreds of livestock, the loss of our former OMAC wood uh, products mill and about 80 homes across the reservation. Many of our families lost everything. The worst, nothing can ever replace the loss of a loved one, and in this case, a small child who was with his parents who were also left in critical condi condition. This past fire season, the Washington State Department of Natural Resources provided assistance to the Cobble Confederated Tribes on more than one occasion, providing a lot of, a lot of assistance to us, especially with uh, the air equipment. <clears throat> the destruction on the Cobble Reservation has also included thousands of acres of commercial forests, aquatic lands, impacts to natural and cultural resources, which translates to millions of dollars of lost forest industry and revenue for many years to come. This also translates to post-fire destruction of bridges and road washouts, mudslides, and impacts to wildlife and water quality. Today, we are experiencing longer fire seasons, larger catastrophic catastrophic fires with significantly more acres burned each year. These fires are encroaching our cities, towns, and family homes. Wildland fires do not have jurisdictional boundaries. Poor forest health and climate change are issues that face all of us. It is very encouraging to see Washington's uh, federally recognized tribes to be included as partners to improve and implement more of a statewide cohesive wildland fire management strategy that addresses forest health while creating resilient landscapes. The Confederated Tribes of the Cobble Reservation encourages state legislators to support the Washington State Department of Natural Resources bill, bill request concerning long-term forest health and the reduction of wildland fire dangers. 
to improve fire adapted communities. And this bill also addresses a critical need to create training and local college programs to build capacity and to offer creative ways to increase certified staffing for, for safe and effective wild, <clears throat> wildfires responses when needed. Support this bill, which will prepare us to prevent another catastrophic event and further devastation and destruction of our precious uh, natural resources. So I just want to uh, um, you know, thank Hillary and also Representative Springer and Kretz for sponsoring this bill. Um, you know, we work a lot and very closely with Hillary and her staff, you know, especially during the, the wild lion fire season. And uh, I think one of the things that, you know, we realized, you know, after this, this past uh, fire season is how much we really do need to work, you know, more closely together. Um, you know, during the fires, we see in our families out there actually building fire lines themselves and, you know, working with fire crews. And as Hillary said, you know, the, the resources were stretched very thin. I got a lot of calls from a lot of different federal and state agencies, but um, several times, you know, they, they expressed to me that there, there, there just wasn't any certified personnel available that they could really send our way that, you know, most of the resources had been, you know, deployed since there were so many fires that occurred, you know, in, especially in the Pacific Northwest at the same time. So, um, you know, it, I always say that we're the poster child for climate change here on the Colorado Reservation. We've experienced pretty much every natural disaster you can imagine in the last five to 10 years. So, um, you know, I, when I learned of this bill and, you know, the, that Hillary put together, I, um, I'm very you know, much in support of uh, seeing this um, move forward because, you know, it's, these additional resources are what we really need, you know, and I hope we don't pray we don't have another fire season like we did this last summer, but in, in the event that, you know, we do, that we'll be much better prepared. So thank each one of you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman Costin. Next, we will close out our speaking program with Daniel Lyon, who is a close friend of our DNR family and a wildland fire survivor himself. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, having me speak. It's an honor for me to uh, be invited to this. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Daniel Lyon, and I was um, in the Twist River Fire in 2015, I was a former wildland fire fighter working for the U.S. Forest Service at the time. Um, in 2015, I, uh, I suffered burns to over 65% of my body, and I've spent the um, last several years recovering from that. And you know, the uh, even worse than that is the fact that three of my buddies lost their lives that day fighting that fire, and several other firefighters were injured as well. And as the years have gone past since Twist, Twist River, you know, I've um, initially had thought fire season can't get much worse than that. And sadly, it has. And especially here in, um, in our state and even more specifically in Western Washington. Um, after I was injured, I actually moved to Montana and I was uh, recovering there. And I would come to Western Washington during the, the summers because it was a way to get away from the massive fires that was going on in Montana. And then it seemed like these fires have followed me to Western Washington, where we've seen catastrophic um, events like last year. And it's why the, I believe um, this bill is crucial because um, it is, as the commissioner said, it's an investment. I look at this as more of a, as an investment than an expense because it, is, it has the potential to save property. It has the potential to save lives. And it, um, it has the potential of, of saving our, our firefighters and helping them on the, on the front lines battle these blazes. Um, in 2015, uh, you know, there was a um, financial funding had been cut for um, our training and I had seen uh, what the results of that led to. And that's why it's important that this bill is passed. Um, when I look at what this bill is going to be funding, uh, everything from training our firefighters to uh, educating our communities, um, I, I think that's uh, priceless. When you look at how many firefighters we have to, to, and compare it to how large these fires that we are battling are, it is necessary that we educate our communities 
through the Firewise program and such things as that, so that uh, we can um, essentially help our firefighters battle these blazes when the time comes when our, these homes are already um, prepped for what might come their way and that there's already barriers between these houses and the forest. That's why it's so important to educate um, our citizens on what is um, what could potentially happen next year. So uh, I really encourage everyone to look over this bill, um, to pass this bill. I think it's crucial for our, our communities, for our firefighters. And I can't thank all of you enough for um, um, supporting this bill. And Commissioner, uh, thank you for your work um, uh, in putting this bill forward. Daniel, thank you very much. At this time, with all of our speakers accounted for, uh, we can uh, open it up to questions from the media. Uh, the way that I will do this is I'm going to try and call on those of you who are able to RSVP. If you, uh, we cannot get to you because we have such a large attendance here, I've put my info in the chat, he says, stalling for time. I've put my info in the chat uh, so that you can follow up with any follow-up questions you might have. We will also be sending out the link to this and uh, more information after the event. So with that, Laurel Demkovich with the uh, spokesman review, did you have a question that you wanted to address to any of the speakers? Um, I do, yes. Um, this is either for the commissioner or Representative Springer. Um, you've already talked a little bit, Commissioner, about how this main this issue may not necessarily be top of mind right now for people. Um, but is this something that you think is on legislators' minds, especially given all the other issues this year related to COVID and the budget? Does this have support in the legislature, and is this going to be the year that you finally get funding for? Um, these issues? I'll take a first um, uh, sort of stab at this and then definitely Representative Springer jump in. Um, you know, we know right now there's enormous amount of challenges that are on the front of our legislators' minds. Um, one is just doing the virtual legislative session, which is challenging by itself, but obviously the impacts of COVID on our economy, on our public health, on our communities. Um, in all of my conversations with legislators um, in both the House and the Senate, Republican and Democrat and Eastern and Western Washington legislators, I have heard uh, strong, strong support that we have to do something. I think this last uh, year fire season was definitely a wake up call, uh, not only in the context of smoke that filled the sky and made it impossible to go outside, but how much our communities were at risk how many fires were on the landscape, um, how in 72 hours, 600,000 acres burned and on um, both east and west side of the states, were, communities were threatened, our firefighters were threatened. Um, and so I've definitely heard that support. And I think what we have here is we have large support for critical needs of what we're funding. And now we have to figure out with the legislature how to fund it. Um, and I believe the moment is now, and I think that our legislators uh, are going to rise to this challenge. Um, it will be a big push. It'll be a significant push, but I believe they understand the crisis at hand. The one last thing I would say, which is what Representative Springer brought up, is this isn't a question of whether we choose to fund investing in wildfire response, forest restoration, and community resilience. Um, we are already spending, and we're spending to the tune on average $153 million a year. Um, just the 2015 fires cost over $300 million for our state that one year. Um, the question is whether we're going to pay to react in the face of flames and smoke and threat to lives, um, or we're going to invest proactively on the ground to be able to get on those fires quickly, reduce the damage and destruction, and give our forests and our communities a fighting chance against these fires. Representative Springer, you may want to jump in here also. So I think it goes without saying at this point that that uh, the legislature clearly recognizes uh, the problem that we face here. There's no question about that. I, I don't hear any pushback from legislators about whether this is a real problem or or not. Uh, they accept that, and I think that's that has 
uh, proven to be the case when you have fires break out in the west side of the mountains and Bonnie Lake and, and when the Olympic Peninsula of all places uh, experiences wildfire, that gets people's attention. So I, I, I think there'll be a good deal of legislative support for, uh, for the effort here. The, the area that will be the hardest to work out will be the funding source necessary to provide that $125 million of biennium. Um, and that's always the largest struggle uh, is how to pay for what we know we need to pay for. Um, so uh, I spoke with the chair of the uh, uh, Agricultural and Natural Resource Committee, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Representative Chapman, I spoke with him yesterday about this bill. It's introduced today. Uh, he assured me it will have a hearing very soon. Uh, as a matter of fact, that committee meeting starts and I have to go to that committee meeting in about 20 minutes. Um, and uh, we'll be hearing that bill uh, soon in session, uh, and then we'll get busy on uh, working on a funding source. Thank you, Representative. Uh, next, I'll ask uh, Cairo TV. Did you all have a question you wanted to pose to any of the speakers? Sounds good. Uh, Cairo Radio. And now I'll go to Emily Fitzgerald, the Chronicle. Hi, uh, sorry about that. Um, yes, thank you for your presentation and all the information. Um, I would like to follow up sort of on the previous question um, and comment about uh, funding sources. What are um, representative in your opinion and experience, what are possible funding sources that you think would be considered? Um, so that's a difficult question to answer on the uh, second day of the legislative session. Uh, we have certainly looked at a number of, of funding sources, one of which of course is at least in part the, the uh, state general fund. Uh, there's a problem with that, however, and that is if you if you're going to create a commitment to a 20 year program of forest health, which probably includes signing some contracts with private uh, contractors to do selective logging, for example, or forest clearing. Um, you can't rely on, on uh, a general fund appropriation every two years if you're trying to sign a 10 year contract. So um, that may have a role, the general fund may have a role to play, but it's not going to be the, the key there. Uh, we've looked at uh, insurance premiums, um, and those are, you know, I'll put it this way, every single revenue option that will be proposed will have a detractor. That's just the nature of the work we do. Um, so um, the commissioner may want to weigh in. There is a, you know, we've, we've got to see with a number of, of possibilities there that have not been vetted yet um, in any real detail. Uh, we're getting busy on that right now. So I know that answer is vague, but there really aren't any great answers just yet. So the commissioner may have some, may have some druthers there, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you, Representative Springer. You know, Emily, I think one of the things, like I said, you know, the fact is, is that we have uh, largely support unanimous across the board as to what needs to be done and that this bill puts forward um, what people, our legislature and our communities and our firefighters and fire chiefs all believe needs to have the right investment. The debate is over how we fund it. Um, I think it's possible that in this funding sort of strategy, we may have multiple funding sources. As I think Representative Springer is pointing out, it doesn't have to be one funding source. It can be multiple funding sources that may fund capital side, may fund um, the operating and maintenance. And, and I think we have the ability now as we work with the legislature um, to come up with those diverse sources. Uh, before session started, we brought a bipartisan group of legislators in the House and Senate that represented East and Western Washington, represented Republican Democrat to come forward and explore ideas we had for potential funding sources. Um, some of those were quickly uh, moved aside didn't have much chance of success, and we're now sort of narrowing in on a number of them, but I think a lot is to be determined as we work through the legislative session here. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, Como News, did you have anything you want to follow up? 
Sure, thanks. Uh, Commissioner, you clearly brought up the need for forest management last summer. Uh, this is despite a lot of federal leaders saying we don't take it seriously here on the West Coast. It's here in the bill today. In case some people who think forest management is the big factor in reducing fires and they're listening right now, can you talk about the importance of it? Absolutely. Uh, we do have a forest health crisis in Washington state. Just in central nation Washington, we already know we have 2.7 million acres of forest that are dead and dying. About 1.3 million acres is federal lands, 240,000 acres is state land, that's Department of Natural Resources, State Parks, WDFW, uh, almost 500,000 is tribal lands. And then we have also private landowners um, around that 300,000 acres. So, we know that we have a forest health crisis. And what that means is we have, uh, in that 2.7 million acres, we have dead, dying, diseased trees that are weakened. They're weakened because hotter, drier conditions. They're weakened by more dense forests than were natural, go back 100 plus years. And they're all competing for limited resources. Uh, we recognize that if we were going to change the trajectory of these catastrophic wildfires year after year, we had to get at the root of the issue by helping give our forests a fighting chance of fighting wildfires because wildfire isn't unnatural in our forests. What's unnatural is how dense and intense our fuel load is on our current forests, especially in central and eastern Washington. Uh, so this plan, um, as you know, we've developed a 20-year forest health plan that has us treating 1.25 million acres of forest over the next 20 years. The legislature joined with us and adopted that plan into statute. We are committed to working together to do that work. Um, it would be about set, treating 70,000 acres a year. But to do that, we need funding uh, to make it possible. And this legislation would help create a dedicated revenue so that year after year, we knew we had those resources available to truly change the trajectory of these catastrophic fires and help give our forests a fighting chance against wildfires. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Next, uh, Steve Jackson, Spokane Public Radio. Are you still on? No problem. Uh, King Five, did you want to ask anything? Next, I'll go to Kirk. Uh, Kirk, did you want to ask anything? Well, um, I don't know if there was any way you could elaborate on uh, how the plan might affect certain specific forest lands. I'm, I'm just thinking of um, the Olympic National Forest um, that's, that's right in our backyard here in, uh, here in Mason County. If you just wanted to kind of elaborate on um, Kirk, I lost your end of your question where you asked to elaborate on and then it dropped off. I don't know if we can get better audio there for you. Uh, maybe. Oh. Are you there, Kirk? Yeah, I, I don't have the best connection here. I do have oh. to apologize for that. Um, but it just... It, because you're speaking in general terms, of course, in, in, in terms of all forest lands. And so I just I was just trying to sort of localize that for our readers um, to give them an example of, you know, how that might how that might affect them in terms of the the biggest uh, set of forest lands that we have right in our backyard. Right. Yeah. So let me first start with um, we obviously have sort of a blueprint for central and eastern Washington forests. If you look at our 20-year forest health plan, we've actually identified those forests that are in um, the sort of it's a watershed level, the worst condition. They're the red zones. They have the worst condition forests with the closest proximity to population centers. Um, we've already assessed over 2 million acres of what are the treatments that need to happen on those forests to restore their health and reduce these catastrophic fires. Um, we are now working to focus on the west side as we're seeing um, increasing dying off of our forests um, on the west side, which is leading to these increasing catastrophic fires on the west side of our state. 
we will take the similar same approach of being able to identify we're agnostic to property lines because disease and fire doesn't follow property lines. We will go at a watershed level of identifying those floors, what their condition is, closest proximity to population center, and then doing the treatments um, on that uh, or so. Um, we recently completed the forest action plan for the entire state, which sort of starts to lay out the frame for the west side um, forest health, um, but that work would continue. And I think it's important, as you pointed out, the Olympic Peninsula, our national forests are some of the most significant at risk. Um, they have some of the most significant health issues. Uh, we signed the Good Neighbor Authority with the federal government back in 2017 that enables us to be able to go do work on federal land so we can go more efficiently and effectively um, and make sure that um, all of our forests in Washington State uh, get healthier. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Q13, are you on and do you want to ask a question? Then next I'll go to Eric Schwartz with the Reflector and Nisqually Valley News. Uh, Coin, did you want to ask anything? TVW, was there anything you wanted to bring up? And if not, then uh, Levi, uh, Investigate West, did you want to get anything? Yeah, hey, uh, thank you guys so much for making time today. and. Uh, it Especially thanks to Daniel uh, Lyon for uh, continuing to uh, work uh, to protect the people of our state. Um, I I wanted to ask about um, the uh, the the kind of jobs and training part of this. Um, can um, can you guys speak to what that what that would look like five ten years down the road? What what are we training people to do, and uh, what will what will that mean for uh, rural Washington? Yeah, great question. Uh, if you, when you look at the bill, you're going to see a pretty substantial um, piece there on workforce development. Um, we are looking at how we expand and invest in the people of Washington State to be able to do a number of things. One is in wild firefighting. It, the reality is, as many of our firefighters at the local and state level, and even federal level, are nearing retirement age. We are not training the next leaders in firefighting, um, not only at the first level, but all the way up to the type uh, one, two, and three incident management teams. Um, the goal here would be developing uh, a workforce that we can give them consistent employment in firefighting, move up the ladder, um, and be able to move into opportunities at the local and the state level. Um, and just so you understand, you know, incident management teams are absolutely critical for firefighting. Uh, we need them, uh, and we only have 17 in the entire nation. Um, and they respond to not only wildfires, but they respond to earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, the natural and human health disasters like COVID. This year, we faced um, a significant challenge in not having enough incident management teams and not having the levels we needed. The Cold Spring Fire that Chairman Costin talked about is a perfect example. We're on that fire. We had skeleton crews at all levels, um, at entry level wildland firefighting all the way up to incident management. We had an incident management type three on that, which is about a 15 to 17 member crew. It should have been a 50 to 75 incident management type two team at least, um, but we couldn't get those resources. They were already fully deployed in other states. And when we tried those other states, their uh, risk of population and communities was far greater than ours and we kept losing out. We need to be also training in dozer bosses. We need to be training in logistics on firefighting. Um, so there's a huge pipeline opportunity there. Uh, and again, at the local and the state level of workforce development. We also need to be training people in forestry and fire science. Prescribed fire is an area that we are trying to expand in Washington State. 
Um, it is um, bringing fire back to our landscape when it's safe to do. Um, and we have limited uh, technical expertise within the state to be able to rapidly increase the number of prescribed fire treatments we're trying to do um, to meet that 20 year forest health plan. We also are needing people to be able to do the work in forestry and forest health, to be able uh, to get on the landscape and do the forest health treatments, removing those smaller diameter trees, removing the dead dying disease trees. So when you look at the bill, you'll see a pretty substantial workforce development that even starts to um, share and teach forestry at the elementary high school level and moving all the way up to um, secondary and technical and community college level, um, as well as apprenticeship work. Thank you so much, Commissioner Luke with the Yakima Herald. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, so obviously we, we dealt with a lot of fire around here. Um, just wondering, uh, and maybe Chief Becker can speak to this as well, but when you speak to the, the local fire departments, what sort of resources do, do, they, need, do they need most that this bill would provide? The, uh, from a local standpoint, yeah, okay. From a from a local standpoint, um, I think what we experienced this year in the Sumner Grade Fire really, really illustrates the, the issue. Um, you get one of these fires, and and you get all your resources tied up. That happened to us. Uh, we were one hundred percent committed, including some of our mutual aid, and we had another fire break out in a mobile home park where before our reserve resources and more mutual aid could get there, uh, we had four mobile homes involved. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the big things. It's, we have other things going on, you know, besides these wildfires. And if we tie everything up on a wildfire, we're unable to, to answer the heart attacks. We're, un, we're unable to answer the next fire. Uh, so it has a cascading uh, event on the, the impacts on the safety of, of the public. The, uh, you know, in Eastern Washington, I, I know, you know, uh, from some of the reports I read throughout the summer, they're doing, uh, getting more support from DNR on aerial resources and able to hit some of those uh, fire starts, you know, uh, before they, they get too big. Uh, unfortunately, you know, some, some get, get away. And, uh, but it's, it's that ability. It's what else do we go? You know, our, normal, our normal job is still going on. And then we get a, a large wildfire that ties everything up. Uh, for us during the Sumner grade fire, our dispatchers were having to tell people that were calling in with chest pain, you know, potentially a heart attack, that uh, they were being interviewed to a uh, deeper level than what is normal and being told, take an aspirin and call us back if it gets worse because we've got nobody to send you. you know, these, these are people experiencing chest pain that have, you know, we have always said, call us and we'll, we'll be there. We were unable to do that for a couple of days during the Sumner grade fire. And, and I got it. That was not only dangerous for the public, but that was pretty uh, damaging uh, to those of us uh, working in the field that have dedicated our careers uh, to protecting and serving people. Luke, I'll, and I'll add to that. I think, you know, I think COVID has really um, brought to the forefront how critical our first responders are, our firefighters. Uh, many of us think about firefighters as fighting fires, whether it's a structural fire or whether it's a wildland fire, but the reality is they are first on the line at responding to all of our crisis within a community. Um, and the reality is not only do they have all of those challenges, but when wildland fires hit, um, it becomes an all hands on deck, especially because we have limited resources. Um, an example really is in Malden itself, where in that community, they have eight volunteer firefighters. Five of those firefighters were on another fire in a neighboring community when Mald the fire came through Malden and destroyed that community in just a few hours. Um, our firefighters also move between communities. Um, for example, we'll have a firefighters from Bonnie Lake fight in Eastern Washington in many seasons. Um, and in this case, when you have 56 fires in the first day of Labor Day and then 24 the next day, every single one of our firefighters were already fully deployed on those fires. And we couldn't get more firefighters from other states 
Um, I do remember a few years ago, we had to bring firefighters from Australia because there were no firefighters to be available um, given how many fires we had um, and how significant they were. Um, and I think it's important that we are investing at our local level in the firefighters, bringing more firefighters in. It's also important for people to realize that currently we have almost 400,000 acres of unprotected land in Washington. This means they are not covered by a fire, uh, fire district, volunteer or not volunteer fire district. It means they're not covered by the Department of Natural Resources wildland firefighting team. Um, and in my mind, every acre of Washington State, every home in Washington State should have fire protection. Um, and that's part of what we are trying to work for for this dedicated bill is that not only will every acre and every home have fire protection, but we will make sure we have the critical resources we need in protecting those communities from wildland fire, as well as, as Chief Backer points out, all the other things our firefighters are responding to. Thank you, Commissioner. We got time for maybe one or two more questions. We are at the 10 o'clock mark. So uh, some of our speakers, uh, if you have to depart, uh, appreciate your participation today. Um, Courtney Flat, did you want to get a question in? Sure. Um, just uh, Commissioner Friends and everyone, thank you so much for taking our questions. Um, just to follow up on what you just said, um, Commissioner, I'm wondering um, if this bill or if there are future bills um, planned for the session that will look at rural fire protection associations that could potentially help with um, covering some of those un unprotected areas? Yeah, so I know this is one of those issues that has come up quite often. And if you look at our wildfire strategic plan, our 10 year that was built by local, state and federal agencies is one of the top recommendations in there. Um, this year, currently we do not have legislation on that. I think it's an area that we need to be focusing on. Um, what we are looking at with this bill is to be securing the dedicated revenue needed for wildfire response, community resilience, and forest restoration. And we are looking at coming back in future years on um, being able to ensure we have protection for those almost 400,000 acres of unprotected lands in Washington. We have some work to do with the legislature. As you know, it's going to be a pretty significant uh, legislative session, not only because of all the challenges uh, that we have out there um, in our communities, especially with COVID, but also because we're at a virtual session. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, KHQ, did you wanna ask a question? We have Krem. All right, and then I will uh, check my list here one more time. Uh, TJ with the lens, did you want to ask a question? All right, well, everyone, thank you so much for your participation at today's event. Uh, if you have a follow-up question that was not asked, I put my contact info in the chat please feel free to reach out to me uh, to follow up uh, with me. I'm also happy to relay any requests you might have to other speakers on the event today. Um, I think we're adjourned. Thank you everyone for joining to the media. Thank you, Chief Becker. Thank you, Chairman Costin, and thank you, Daniel Lyons. And I uh, appreciate everyone. Um, and thank you for your courage and all that you do to help our community stay strong and safe. All right, thank you, Hillary, and uh, have a good day. Thank you, bye. Thank you all. Stay safe, everyone. Yes. And wear a mask. Yes. <laughs> bye, bye, everyone. Bye, Daniel. It's good seeing you. <laughs> thank you so much, Commissioner, for having me speak. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your leadership and your courage. You're an inspiration. So we're going to go get her done. Absolutely. Bye.